Uh, Epi, my very, very respected and beloved relatives. And I say that, Mitaki Epi, not just those that are with us in our physical view, but all those in the spiritual world that have stood by us and stand by us and forever will be with us, as well as all those relatives yet unborn. As we know, we live not now in the day of prophecies, but in the day of the fulfillment of the prophecies. And that all those prayers and visions that have foretold that a long spiritual winter time would come for 500 years, a time of great suffering, that as sure as the sun rises every morning or the beautiful rain comes, that a great spiritual springtime would emerge. And in this great spiritual springtime, all that had been uncovered, and all that had been hidden would be uncovered. And that we as a human family, as indigenous peoples of this Mother Earth, would arise to our full spiritual maturity. And I was really so thankful to have the opportunity to go down to Rio de Janeiro for the Rio Plus 20. 20 years ago, the leaders of Mother Earth, uh, I shouldn't say the leaders of Mother Earth, the leaders of the nations of Mother Earth, came together to great fanfare of all the things they were going to do to change the dire forecasts, predictions of all the scientists around the world of where we're going to. And of course, 20 years later, we can see that all those good efforts or all those good words have not manifested as promised. That more than ever, we are moving into this incredible time of change, this springtime. And all those things that our elders so clearly warned about some over 500 years ago when the prophecies of the reunion of the condor and eagle, at the time of the union of the condor and eagle, every one of these prophecies has come to pass. Every one of these prophecies is now, the fulfillment is now before us. And in Rio, what was so powerful to, to experience was Sundance Chief Reuben George, who will be here to speak tomorrow, about the great Avatar moment that's going to happen on Burrard Inlet, where right as we speak here, without any consultation, without free prior informed consent of any First Nation or the city of Vancouver or anyone, in 2007, quietly they begin to send out tankers, each loaded with 700,000 barrels of bitumen, tar sands, oil, out right out Burrard Inlet, only twice a week because these tankers only have this much clearance under the Second Narrows Bridge when they go out, so they have to go out in high tide. And not only that, Lee talked about this sludge at the bottom of Burrard Inlet. And of course, they're continually dredging that and have increased the dredging since they've been sending out these big, big oil tankers. And because it's against international maritime law to dump this sludge, which has radioactivity in it, because of all the uranium that's shipped out of that port, all kinds of other natural spillages that occur, they dump it off Point Grey. Most people don't know that. And so, in the long run, it's really clear that the Aboriginal legal order on this unceded land in which we stand and have the honor to be here is in fact a legal order in itself.
that has never been surrendered, ever. And not only that, as far as I'm concerned, all these treaties that have been made across this North America, I doubt, my Uncle Vine Deloria said, he said they were all broken. I won't make that full statement because I haven't seen every one. But I would say if we went to the communities of all our indigenous peoples across the North, the people of the Eagle, and we were to ask the community members, have these treaties, have these agreements that were made with your grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents, have they been fulfilled? Have these agreements been fulfilled? Have your children and grandchildren and elders and community members, have they received what those elders, when they sat there and signed those treaties, believed they were to receive? And I believe that practically in every place where these treaties have been signed, the people, the people themselves, would say these treaties are broken. Therefore, when you break treaties, and they'd, you'd, get, you'd find that real quick if you weren't, didn't make your car payments, what they do, that as far as I'm concerned, all this land is unseated. And all this land needs to have a readjustment in terms of the balance and the respect and honor of whose lands all these great developments. Uh, and so I believe that's where we're coming to. It's going to be a strong stand. I saw this in Brazil. It's arising between the indigenous legal order of this Mother Earth, of which I stand with, built in the natural laws and the guiding principles of our cultures all around Mother Earth. Then there's the Canadian legal order. And then there's the international legal order. We're coming to a place where these legal orders and the sovereignty and the wellness of our communities are going to come to a reckoning. And I believe when I was down in Brazil, we went out to this special indigenous village in which uh, parts of it were only the indigenous people from there. We were, of course, brought with them to, into all the different parts. But here they were from the center of the Amazon. Hundreds and hundreds of these relatives, all dressed in their traditional clothes. And I had an idea because I've spent time in Panama with the Kuna relatives that our Amazonian relatives were, you know, about my size, which is not very tall. I like, especially if they're a little bit smaller than me, I like to stand by them, it makes me feel a little bit taller. But these relatives were, some of them were about six foot five, six foot four. And I mean to say they, they were in tremendous condition. And they were one heart and one mind. And when you see the pictures with their armbands, what were the colors? Red, yellow, black, and white. What were the colors? Red and black. These same colors. And on the second day, the first day we were there for the lighting of the sacred fire, where the message, where the message from this gathering and the, the words from this gathering, a sit and greeting, were blessed and affirmed on that sacred fire. And when the fire was lit, one of these young men, about 6'3", and I mean to say he was, he was in terms of in a physical sense, he, he was in the top condition. He fell down across where this fire was, had been lit and wept and wept and wept and wept and wept for what he knows is happening to our beloved Mother Earth. And so the next day we came, they were all there to dance. And, and this must have been an arbor about four times the size of this arbor, packed. And you know, the amazing thing was, they came, one family grabbed Reuben and one family grabbed me, and they, they use, have a stomp dance. 
it felt just like you were there doing a stomp dance with the Chickasaws or Choctaws or, or um, Iroquois Confederacy. Same way. It was one. The same issues that we face here are the same issues they face there. But the, the strength of spirituality, the strength of oneness, the strength of a common vision, you could feel it, you could taste it. And then afterwards, we went into a special place and we danced for two hours. I kind of went off, my, my uh, nephew, Toshka, Ruben kept, kept saying, uncle, uncle. I said, no, we're going to enjoy this. <laughs> Come on, uncle. <laughs> I said, let's get down with this. You know, I'm not dead yet. I'm not dead yet. This is the time of our greatest strength, Mitaki Epi. This is the time to arise. This is the time when all that we've been praying for will unfold in its own time and place, but it's coming on us very, very quickly. I was just up in Thompson, Manitoba for a weekend with the elders council there. They're preparing. They're putting in lots of extra wood. Lots of extra wood. They know in their community who has a fireplace and who doesn't. They're putting in lots and lots of food. Because Mitaki Epi, there's going to be a period of time. It's unavoidable. It's, it's, it's something that is part, it comes with the dinner of change. When the food supplies will, in terms of movement and economy, and money will cease for a time. So we've got to prepare ourselves. We've got to fill our homes with as much food, with access to water, with access to wood, with whatever we need so that we can, in fact, sustain ourselves through this. Because what simply has happened, and I say this, and I'm sure those there in this sacred circle uh, who have suffered from any addiction whether it be alcoholism or drug abuse, whatever, we know that there's certain places there's a bottom. That's one beautiful thing about the disease of addiction. I think it's the greatest disease to have of any disease. Because the only way out is a spiritual path. No other way but to completely surrender to the Creator and completely give ourselves to the Spirit. And so Mitaki Epi, just like an individual, addict, individual addict hits bottom, hits bottom on their knees, tears running down your face, asking, please, please, not a moment more of this. And somehow that spirit will answer in the most miraculous, wonderful way. Well, Mitaki Epi, the global society we live in has become an addict is addicted, just like an individual addict, to all the natural physical resources of Mother Earth, to who can have the most physical things, completely addicted. So the question comes, Mitaki Epi, to reflect on, what is the bottom that this materialistic civilization has to come to, to completely give up this unsustainable path we've been on for over 500 years and begin to walk that red road together as one human family. We know we've hit that bottom if we're sitting here. And so we know that the Creator has nothing happen except for our own perfecting. So we've been prepared for this for over 500 years. We are stronger and will prove to be stronger than ever before as we move into the future. Why? Because we know that all of our elders have prayed for us and we know there's not one parent sitting here, not one grandparent sitting here if you pray for your children, you don't want them to go further than you. 
We don't pray and say, well, please make my son do less in his life than I have. Please let my daughter do less than me. Please let my family that's coming after me uh, not accomplish what I do. No, we pray for them to become the most they can become. And that's why we have this responsibility globally in our children that are not yet born will be respected and seen to give upliftment and understanding to all the relatives of the human family. That's what we've been prepared for. That's why we've gone through this incredible suffering, but we've never given up, like Brother Lee said, those, fan, those flags there. Never given them up. We have been down on our knees a few times, but we have never, ever, ever surrendered. Have any of you surrendered here in this circle? No. To the Creator. To the great Creator, yes. But we've never given up hope, we've never given up faith. So the last thing is, <clears throat> um, Brother Robert Nahaney's here with his beautiful wife, Judy. And you know, there's somebody I want to recognize. I, I mean, I really give thanksgiving to, to all the chiefs and Daryl and Mike. They continued. Never, never, never continue to stop praying. So I really appreciate this. So, to conclude this, uh, Brother Robert is going to be right here at this side. Is Robert there? Yes. Come on out. He's going to fill, while I'm finishing this little talk, he's going to fill a pipe here for a purpose. A pipe, and I'm going to share this briefly with you. We shared it last year. But in... December 29th, 1979, that was 89 years after the Wounded Knee Battle. After the Wounded Knee Battle. A brother from the Washington State Penitentiary, Leon Gaze, was shanked inside the Washington State Penitentiary. I just picked up Leon, uh, oh, and he was hitchhiking about three months before. It's just such a fine fine, fine man. But he'd been shanked by relatives uh, from Mexico over a pool game. And of course that's really sad. And I'm glad to see our relatives from Mexico here because really, Mitakiepi, the only difference between us on this hemisphere is indigenous people is one of the relatives came here, spoke French, another one spoke Spanish, another spoke Portuguese, another spoke English. That's, that's the only difference. But now it's a coming together of everyone. So anyway, it was December 29th. My sister and brother-in-law had been to the penitentiary to, build, to, to visit one of our good brothers there. They'd come out just as they took Leon out in the gurney. And, of course, I, I just broke my heart. And I called up to see Alan. There was Roberto Maestas from the Central de la Raza and Bernie White Bear and others. They came together and and came into the institutions there and they made peace between the Latino Chicano brothers and the uh, uh, indigenous brothers who spoke English and made that union and continue that brotherhood that continues today in all our institutions. And so after that, I won't, I won't go into this in, in, in detail at this point, but after that um, through uh, one of his relatives bringing some hair of his and then through some uh, Leonard Crow Dog and others a ceremony was done for a year called keeping a soul ceremony for Leon for one year and this is a very 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 difficult ceremony because you know at all times there's somebody with you their spirit is with you well anyway it came time to complete that ceremony, exactly 90 days to the year of the Wounded Knee Massacre, where they slaughtered those 313 people <clears throat> at Wounded Knee. And so I called my father, who was kind of responsible for the brothers there in the, in the uh, institution, and they said, he said, Phil, I'm sorry. There's been a killing, it's locked down, you cannot come inside this institution right now. 
And Dad, I said, we have to finish this. He said, no, son, it's, it's, you have to pray. Well, sure enough, right before that time, I took a drive up to Seattle, and I felt so lonely. It was almost, that was Leon's kind of, uh, uh, how do I, stomping ground, so to speak. And I could just feel that loneliness that he felt. And as I drove back across, um, there was an elder woman I'd known who um, had been adopted and taken in by many different tribes and who was a caretaker of many, many sacred items. And she had a series of banks there. And to make a long story short, on December 28th, 1980, I was sitting with my mom and dad, um, uh, having gone the night before and actually had seen where Tashunka Wheat Coast pipe, Crazy Horse's pipe, had been brought by these elders from South Dakota in 1952 because things were being sold and they wanted it to be protected and kept quiet. And at that time, um, having witnessed that, um, the phone call came and said, you know, this is meant to come back to the people and be kept quietly. And at the same time, five minutes after that call, I mean, five minutes before that call, the prison calls, called up and said, tomorrow you can come in at 3 o'clock. Leon was, was, was shanked at 3.30. So sure enough, we went, we completed that ceremony with all the brothers, took flesh offerings, Right after we finished that, we drove right down to Hermiston, Oregon, to this bank vault, and Sam Windy Boy from the Rocky Boy Crees came, and we came back, and a lodge was made, and this was kept. It's been kept, and the first time in 31 years, it was time to bring it out quietly, was here. And since that time, it's traveled different places, and this spring, the beginning began at the women's institution in Abbotsford. And the women prayed with it and sent uh, cloth offerings with it. And so this pipe that's being filled here, it's going to be taken to the pit house. And some of the sisters are going to pray with that uh, Chinupa Wakan, with that pipe. And it'll be there for anybody who wants to, as last year, wants to come and to have a prayer and have your own experience for yourself. But I think the thing to remember most of all is no matter how sacred a pipe are, we are that sacred. That each of us, ourselves, are sacred beings, the children of one father and one mother. That each of us is a sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. And it's all our responsibilities, because all of us are part of the circle of life, and that makes us all indigenous people, no matter who you are here in this circle, to care for our mother and care for one another. Anything you'd like to say, brother? Thank you. Thank you so very, 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 very much for being here, for taking the time to listen, and we thank the, the uh, clouds for being so kind. <laughs> and give us just the right amount of water. How? Thank you. Brother Mike. Thank you.